never had such a polite greeting from you guys in my life. So, how are you all? The, um, uh, yesterday, uh, we talked about uh, the need for Australia to compete in the global economy. And uh, part of being able to compete means that we produce the best educated, best skilled, best trained workforce anywhere in the world. Um, it's about giving our kids the best opportunities possible through our school system to keep, compete with those kids who are emerging from the schools right across Asia and elsewhere in the world um, whose um, education levels are rising and rising and rising. So we've got to make sure our kids keep up and they can compete in the future as well. Of course, the other part of ensuring that we are making the economy competitive is to make sure that the economy also is capable of uh, managing the cost of living pressures faced by Australian families. And one of those cost of living pressures relates to the day-to-day -day costs of childcare. Um, and uh, under our Better Schools Plan, which um, Bill Shorten has been working on so effectively uh, over the last several weeks in his negotiations, uh, under that Better Schools Plan, we intend to deliver an extra 1.6 million on average for Australian schools uh, over the next six years. Funding that would enable teachers to provide more one-on-one -on -one attention for kids. That's all part of making sure our kids get better educational qualifications. The other great thing about our schools, though, uh, is that we've been investing in new facilities, multi-purpose facilities, uh, better libraries right across the nation. Two or three thousand uh, new multi-purpose facilities in schools, two or three thousand new libraries as well. And one of the things that goes on in our schools is to make sure that our kids can be uh, looked after properly before school and after school uh, through what's called before and after school care or out of school hours care. Uh, a kid's development uh, doesn't just begin at nine and end at three, we all know that. Uh, today what I want to announce is that the government will give parents a further helping hand in this regard through our Better Schools Before and After School Plan. The government will invest an additional $450 million in schools looking to establish outside school hours care on their grounds or extend the hours that they currently offer. This initiative will see, number one, more flexible school opening hours before and after school and during school holidays. Number two, additional places in areas where parents need access to out of school hours care and significantly, new high quality services activities and programs for kids such as music programs, supervised sport, homework clubs, the practical stuff which makes that time before or after school useful and, and a fun place to be as well. And what I've seen around the country already is with our out-of-school hour care, care programs, uh, these uh, kids and uh, those who supervise them in many places using the multi-purpose facilities we've built right across the country. In fact, I saw one of these just the other day in Adelaide. So this is a direct measure to help with the cost of living pressures and family pressures faced right across the nation. Um, from 2014, up to 500 schools uh, will benefit from extended services and improved activities. Around uh, 345,000 kids aged mostly between five and 12 stand to benefit from the initiative. Uh, our before and after school uh, plan has a triple benefit. Better education services for our kids, more flexibility for parents to balance their work and family lives and to help with cost of living pressures and to increase the opportunities for employment participation, in particular for women. Ever I go across Australia, uh, what I hear is cost of living pressures and the pressures on family life in general. And this is designed to help families with cost of living pressures and to help deal with the time constraints of daily life. For the kids themselves, uh, what um, Kate and Bill and I have just been talking about is the importance of making sure that this time before and after school is also well spent. As I said, organised homework is part of it, but we've also seen great programs around the country whereby there's supervised physical activity, kids are taken out from behind the computer, run around chasing balls, putting balls through hoops, doing all that sort of thing. That's very good. And also provides the opportunity for music programs. It really is horses for courses. It depends what individual out-of-school hour care programs want. 
For example, services could open earlier from 7 in the morning or stay open later until perhaps even 7 in the evening. Extra hours could also be available for vacation care during school holidays. This, I think, is a very good initiative for Australian families um, and the pressures that they are, on, they are under. Uh, of course, this is on top of the school kids bonus, which is already helping 1.3 million families, which Mr Abbott says he's going to abolish, um, and also the introduction of Australia's first national paid parental leave scheme. Just before I turn to my colleagues for a further comment on this, let me just add some uh, observations on one or two other things that the government uh, is engaged in today. Uh, today, Minister Carr, uh, Kim Carr, has announced a $200 million assistance package for the Australian auto industry. Uh, we've also announced a mandated 100% Australian-made target for the purchase of Commonwealth Fleet passenger motor vehicles. This funding is in addition to the record $1.5 billion investment in the Australian car industry. Uh, if our 100% policy of using Australian-made vehicles for our own Commonwealth fleet of vehicles was applied across all levels of government, sales of Australian-made vehicles could increase by over 18,000 units a year. I believe our government should get behind the Australian industry. I think it's a good thing to do. And this would represent an 8% increase on 2012 production volumes. Uh, Mr. Minister Carr's in continuing discussions with industry about how the additional $200 million, uh, can uh, best support growth in sales. And, of course, uh, we stand ready to continue to get behind Australian manufacturing more broadly into the future. As I said yesterday, I don't see manufacturing as an industry belonging to the past. I see it as an industry belonging to Australia's future as well. And I note in passing that uh, Mr Abbott has described this necessary assistance to the Australian motor vehicle industry as a band-aid. Well, obviously he doesn't support that $200 million going to the Australian auto industry and he's already lopped off half a billion dollars uh, from what we thought was bipartisan support for the Australian motor vehicle industry, which provides a quarter of a million jobs, direct and indirect, through the auto parts and service industry as well. A few other things I'll take in uh, Q&A, uh, but at this stage let me ask uh, Minister Kate Ellis to add to my remarks on OSHC and then Bill on where it fits within our education plan. Well, thank you very much, Prime Minister. We understand that in modern Australia, parents are working increasingly hard to juggle their work and family commitments. We're proud that we are a government that has made real reforms and investments and programs and policies to help address this constant balancing act which parents face. And today's announcement builds on this very proud record. Now we have seen women's participation in the workforce increase by over 25% in less than a generation. We know that this and other changes mean that governments need to show commitment and they need to show positive plans to support Australians at work. We know that not every job finishes at 3pm when the school bell rings. We also know that parents want to ensure that their children are safe and that they're well cared for in a great environment. Now the number of children who are currently using out of school hours care has increased by over 32% since we came to government in 2007. But we also know that there are many more families out there who would like to be accessing places. Now we believe that after school arrangements shouldn't be a chore and they shouldn't be a bore. Today's announcement means that Australian parents can have the peace of mind to know that their children are in positive environments, that they're with their friends in their local school community, and that they will continue to have extracurricular development in good and safe hands after the school bell. It also though means for children that they will be at the top of their quality school education, that they can be enriched through cultural, through physical, um, activities through homework clubs, through a range of different activities to add to the great education that they're getting already through the school day. Now as a result of the announcement that the Prime Minister has made here today, we will see increased places under this program of around 68, that will cater for around 68,000 additional children who will be supported by quality out of school hours care. This is a good announcement, but it is also a very smart investment. It once again demonstrates that ours is a government that is committed to affordable, accessible and quality childcare. 
We are also a government that recognises that having adequate care solutions in place is the right thing for Australian children, but it's also the right thing to boost our workforce participation and aid our economy. Good, thanks very much, Kate. Now, Bill, just on where this fits within our education plans, then we'll take your questions. Labor, with its Better Schools program, has been a very strong supporter of providing our school children with the best start in life. We've seen that through the significant reforms which have been promoted over the last three years, which saw the Victorian government sign up and gain literally billions of dollars of extra resources for Victorian school children. This announcement about out of our school care demonstrates yet again that when it comes to the quality education of our children in Australia, only Labor has a plan for the future. This support for working parents understands that um, two-income households or indeed single-income households to hold down their work and make sure their kids are getting the right level of care at school do need that extra help. So what this does is this allows, to the extent that it's required, families to be comfortable and secure that they can work and their children will be getting quality new activities to do, that there may be, if they need it, extra hours and there'll be extra places. This is all part of making sure that Australia has better schools. Just to uh, conclude, there was the bread and butter cost of living measure and also it's also about uh, ensuring that our schools are the best possible environments to boost the skills and education levels of our kids. And that's all about preparing the economy for the future and managing the big transition which lies ahead of us. Over Prime, to you, mate. Prime Minister, on the, the announcement, you said that it's going to cost $450 million. Yep. How are you going to uh, pay for that? Can the budget afford it, after we've been told of such big write-downs last week? And is there any eligibility test for children to be able to use it? Well, on the question of um, its uh, affordability, uh, this has been carefully costed and incorporated within the parameters outlined in the government's uh, economic statement last week. And the reason we have advanced this initiative is because we need to help Australian families under financial pressure. Uh, and childcare is a big part of that. We've uh, boosted the childcare rebate from 30 to 50 per cent. Uh, helping families with uh, their other school expenses through the school kids bonus. Uh, $410 in the case of primary school kids, $820 in the case of secondary school kids, and providing better and more opportunities for before and after schools care. We think this is the right thing to do to encourage greater participation in the workforce and to make uh, the family budget stretch a bit further by providing more services and better services after school. On the eligibility questions, uh, Kate, I'll turn to you. Look, the, the services will tender will, through a competitive process to get access to this funding. But it should be also noted that in addition to this funding to provide extra hours, extra places, extra services, parents will of course also be eligible for the childcare benefit and the childcare rebate to pay for these places as well. So, so it's it'll... Not, mean, not means tested in any way? No. no. And, and so Prime Minister, you, you said it's, it's been already accounted for in the uh, yep. economic statement, so it's already paid for. That's, that's correct. We have budgeted for this. It's allocated and that's why we're investing in Australian families and what they need as opposed to Mr Abbott who has said he's going to be in the business of ripping $70 billion out which will mean cuts to jobs, cuts to education, education services uh, as well as cuts to health. Um, over, just behind. Is the $450 million over the Ford estimates? That's correct. Uh, and also you referred earlier to the $200 million for the um, car industry. Can you tell us in broad terms what that's going to do, what it's for, and how you came up with the figure of 200 million? Uh, well, this has been carefully negotiated by Industry Minister Kim Carr, um, and uh, he has been cl in close consultation with the industry in recent weeks. Um, he has done so because, as you know, Kim in the past uh, has uh, worked through with the car industry, uh, motor vehicle industry in Australia, their long term needs uh, for sustaining the motor vehicle manufacturing industry in Australia. Um, and um, on the uh, individual allocations within it, these will be particular to uh, individual manufacturing operations. Uh, furthermore, uh, can I say this, that uh, through our work originally on the new car plan um, and our further investments to support the industry now, we think this is the right way ahead. Why is it necessary? Um, if you look carefully at the economic statement last week, you will see there is now real pressure on jobs. 
because of the change in our global economic circumstances. The China resources boom is ending. As a result of that, we are seeing greater pressure on jobs and greater pressure on living standards and cost of living as well. So when you've got a quarter of a million people working in this sector, I'm not prepared at this stage of the economic cycle to say, so long, see you later. I think it's the right thing to do to get in there and back our manufacturing industries. And as for the other measure that I've outlined here, uh, together with uh, Kate and with Bill, um, this is just practical stuff, practical stuff to help families struggling with cost of living pressures, good for families, good for cost of living, and good for the economy and, and these difficult economic transition which lies ahead of us. Uh, Phil. Uh, Prime Minister, on the mandating of Commonwealth fleet uh, purchases, can you tell me why that's not protectionist and would that deny taxpayers best value for money given you know, the Australian made car may be more expensive than uh, the government could source elsewhere? Well, Phil, it depends at the end of the day what you buy. And, um, and, uh, but we think uh, within an overall policy of this, we're doing, frankly, what most other governments around the world do. Uh, whenever I've been uh, around, the, around the world, I've been in Germany, I tend to always be in a Mercedes-Benz of one description or another, maybe an Audi. Uh, when I'm in Tokyo, um, I'm in a um, uh, Toyota of some description or another. Um, I think it's time we uh, actually back the Australian industry. Um, some people might find this a little old-fashioned, you know, by instinct and predisposition. I'm a free trader from way back. We've had those debates uh, within the Labor Party and we've resolved them. There's nothing wrong with us backing the Australian industry. And I would call upon every level of government to do the same. You know, in Queensland, the current fleet purchasing arrangements, I think, are down to around about 26, 30 per cent, maybe 32 per cent of their entire fleet comes from Australian manufactured vehicles. WA is much the same, very low. So I'd say to those two state governments, lift your game. I'd say to local governments, lift our game. If we do that all together, guess what? We can add together probably 12% on top of um, current units being manufactured by the Australian industry. Uh, Bonge. Uh, Prime Minister, has Queensland missed the bus when it comes to the better schools funding? Well, you know something, uh, being a, um, a uh, proud Queenslander myself, nothing I would have loved more than to get uh, the Liberal National Party government of Mr Newman on board with this, just as we've managed to get Mr Napthine on board in Victoria, Mr O'Farrell on board uh, in um, New South Wales. But if I look at the, uh, the numbers, uh, which um, we were discussing before, Bill and I, uh, if uh, the Newman government, National Party government, Liberal National Party government in Queensland, was to have the same arrangement all factors applying to that which we have negotiated with Victoria, then uh, we would have to see from Queensland an additional $2.5 billion uh, in order for them to pass muster in terms of what's been offered to the Victorians. So what I'd say is, given there's been months and months and months of negotiations with Mr Newman's Liberal National Party government in Queensland, is it why is it left to the last day? And secondly, uh, you're about two and a half billion dollars short. That's what the Victorian deal, all factors taken together, would mean for Queensland. So it's all very easy to jump out of the blocks and say to um, the Australian government at five minutes to midnight, a couple of hours before uh, the caretaker preventions um, uh, take effect, uh, that, uh, oh, by the way, we, we might be interested in this, we think we might. Well, there's a two and a half billion dollar gap and you're about four months uh, late to the action and both Bill and myself I've been in Brisbane, negotiating good faith with the Premier, as I've sought to do with all Premiers, as he's done with all education ministers. And Bill was there at the end of last week. That's right. Doing the same. Been correspondence today. But the core thing is this. If it's a Victorian <laughs> deal, all factors taken together, it would mean that the Queensland Government under the Liberal National Party and Campbell Newman is two and a half billion dollars short of what it would need to invest into Queensland schools over the next uh, six years. Prime yes, Minister, mate. Um, Prime Minister, uh, Tony Abbott has said that uh, he won't enter a minority government with, uh, with any of the independents or the minor parties. Uh, would you be uh, prepared to enter a minority government? And secondly, um, uh, there was a lot of controversy during this term when the, uh, the carbon decision uh, was changed uh, as a result of that. Would you rule out changing any promises that you make during this election campaign uh, if, if you had to enter a deal? 
Uh, what I'd say, it's pretty interesting what Mr Abbott's had to say on this, because I assume the logic which flows from that is Mr Abbott will therefore be putting all independents last in his how to vote around the country. I know for a fact that they're preferencing the Greens, at least I'm advised so by Albo, in the seat of Grandler. I presume they're also going to be pre preferencing the Greens in the seat of uh, Melbourne, with one objective, to make sure the Labor Party doesn't win the seats. So if they're fair dinkum about this, that is, we don't like independents, we don't like Greens, why are they preferencing them all over the country? They're doing the same, I presume, in Denison. Well, a bit of double standards here. As for us, we're on about securing a uh, majority government uh, for the Australian Labor Party because that's in the best interests uh, of the country and that's what uh, I'm putting to the Australian people and that's why we've got a strong policy platform to put forward. On your uh, after schools uh, policy, um, well, just on means testing, there are a lot of parents who already do this. Uh, would they get this payment and um, if not, then don't you create a sort of two-tier system? But if they do, doesn't this just give money to people who don't really need it and might be making a, a, a decision, a life decision? Have you, Kate? Um, the Australian parents who are currently using out-of-school hours care um, do receive the childcare rebate, which is not means tested. So those circumstances would not be changed under this arrangement. The point of this arrangement is trying to ensure that we have more places, more parents able to use those places, and that we have a great variety in terms of the hours that those centres are operating, but also the services that they're putting in place. So it would, would be the same funding arrangement for Australian parents as is already the case. Mr. Does, that, does the money include uh, additional, spend, additional funding funding for the rebate as well as additional funding for the centres? Look, all, all of our costings um, around the estimates moving forward of how many places will be used, how many children are in Australian childcare, um, have been done each mm. budget cycle and continue to be, be, be done and are taken into account. The bottom line is the mm. childcare rebate remains. Okay? Mm. What this is, is an addition to out of school hours care. I've had my kids in out of school hours care in the past. It's a very good service. We're just trying to make it better and more universally uh, available. Yes, mate. Mr. Rudd, are low interest rates a sign of a weak and mismanaged economy? I think um, Mr. Abbott's Treasury spokesman's comments today uh, are an absolute clangor when it comes to cost of living pressures faced by Australian families. Um, when Mr. Abbott's Treasury spokesman says, the fact of the matter is we should not be in a position where interest rates are being cut, that's what he says, that's what he says, uh, then frankly, that's a kick in the stomach to Australian families who are all struggling from cost of living pressures. Effectively, what Mr Abbott's Treasury spokesman is saying is, it's okay, you can have higher interest rates. I don't think that's right. I also don't think it's right for the alternative treasurer of the country to provide public lectures to the Reserve Bank on what they should or should not do. So the bottom line is this. Number one, for cost of living pressures for families, Mr Abbott's Treasury spokesman says you should have higher interest rates uh, rather than lower interest rates. I think it's an appalling statement. Secondly, for an alternative treasurer of the Commonwealth to issue public lectures on what the Reserve Bank should and should not do is an appalling indictment about how you go about managing a sophisticated $1.5 trillion economy. The other point I'd just add is this. Um, it's not just on this question of economic management and cost of living pressures where we find Mr Abbott and his crew wide of the mark. Um, earlier today, uh, I saw the report of his comments about the Australian budget and its relationship to circumstances in Europe. He said um, that um, our budget uh, was going to be as disastrous, in effect, as what we have in Europe. Well, here's just a few facts and figures. I know these are sometimes a trouble for the opposition. Uh, on the question of debt, can I just make uh, this point, that net debt as a percentage of GDP um, across uh, various European countries is something in the order of about 90% on average. 
82.8% in the United Kingdom, 83% in Belgium, 84% in France, 87% in the United States, 134% by the way in Japan, and uh, in Australia in 2013-14 will be 11.7%. So that's just fact number one. Fact number two, let's just say he was just talking not about net debt to GDP, but maybe he's just talking about budget deficits as a percentage of GDP. Well, ours... Uh, in 13-14 will be about 1.9% of GDP, uh, whereas if you look across the rest of Europe, you will find figures much, much higher than that. In fact, the average across Europe is considerably in excess of that. Um, you will find also that uh, on basic economic performance, six quarters of negative economic growth in Europe, we've never been into recession here. So this is just Mr Abbott misleading the Australian people about a core economic fact. The comparison with Europe is false on net debt, is comparison with Europe is false on the question of the budget deficit as a percentage of GDP, and the comparison with Europe is false. Six quarters of negative growth versus a country which hasn't been into recession during the period that we've been in office. So can I just say whether it's not having sufficient smarts about you, to run a sophisticated economy but knowing about the independence of the Reserve Bank, being monstrously insensitive to people's cost of living pressures and just misleading the Australian public about basic facts on um, Australia being compared with Europe, I just think it's time that Mr Abbott fronted for a debate on why he wants to become Prime Minister of Australia and stand up and be accounted for as to where his $70 billion worth of cuts to jobs health and education are going to come from. Mr. Rogers, uh, Mr. Um, on the um, money that you've announced today, is that all completely net new money? There are no offsets in the education budget. And secondly, on the Queensland situation, if re-elected, would you continue to negotiate with the Queensland government, or how would it work? Look, I'm a Queenslander. I want the kids in Queensland schools to do really well, you know? It's, you know, Mr Newman and I mightn't, mightn't be the biggest buddies, but I don't really know many of the other Conservative leaders in the country either. But in good faith, we went there, sat down and sat with his education minister, Mr Langbrook and himself, and tried to strike a negotiation, both on policy, where there is this almost Joe-like fear that the Commonwealth's going to come and control every Queensland school. Well, that's just nonsense. And then, as I said, the problem we now find is that it's a $2.5 billion funding gap. If the government has returned, I would want to negotiate with Queensland and WA to bring them into what is a really good plan for the country's future. By the way, I noticed that um, this uh, Better Schools plan, which was described by Mr Abbott's education spokesman as a total con one day, mysteriously translated into sort of some level of maybe half support the next day, depending on who you believe on which particular day. Um, you've got to be fair dinkum about this. We have a plan. We've been negotiating with the independents, the Catholics, the other states. We've got a whole bunch of people on side. Uh, Campbell Newman, uh, I think, um, if he comes up with $2.5 billion, does the same as the Victorians, would have him on board as well. Uh, Lane. No offsets. Lane. No offsets issue? Uh, on, the, the, on, in the the education budget. on the question of the education budget, Bill's gone through the normal sort of efficiency yeah. exercises within his own portfolio. But on this particular program, this represents net new investment. Just one from that Bill, Prime Minister. There was a two-year-old child mauled to death in far western New South Wales today. Is there anything local, state and or federal governments can do to stop these sorts of attacks? Stop them happening again? Yeah, I just heard about this when I was coming in here just before. Look, I think anyone, um, if, you're a, if you're a parent or you're a grandparent and our little one's one and a bit, um, it's just heartbreaking. It's just awful. It's heartbreaking. And for the parents, this is just uh, horror, absolute horror. On the practicalities of what governments can do, um, I'm all ears in terms of anything, any other level of government wants by way of support on practical measures to control violent dogs. Um, and uh, But that's... Uh, we, we wait for those requests. All I can say, though, is this is just... Um, this is just horrible, absolutely horrible. Mr. Prime Minister, yeah, over here. on the uh, question of accuracy, you've said uh, here today that uh, Tony Abbott is planning $70 billion worth of cuts. I wonder if you could just point to where he's actually said that. 
Well, Mr uh, uh, Hockey uh, announced that number quite a long time ago, point one, they've never walked away from it. Number two, uh, the, uh, tre the finance uh, minister, Penny Wong, released a comprehensive statement on this just the other day which detailed uh, these measures in uh, considerable detail and I'll refer to them. In fact, it comes to 69 uh, billion 670 million in terms of either the measures, uh, the spending measures which they proposed, as well as the cuts they have failed to embrace. You put together those numbers which uh, the government has assembled separately, add that to what Mr Hockey, who is the opposition's Treasury spokesman, $70 billion uh, is an entirely uh, credible uh, number. But I'd say this, here we are, day one, into an election campaign where Mr Abbott has already said he's begun work on his uh, victory speech. That's what he said. And Mr Lochnane in this city a couple of months ago said that the Liberal Party had won the election. As I said yesterday, we enter this campaign as underdogs. For goodness sake, Mr Abbott, have a debate to explain what the bottom line figure is. What will you cut? What will you spend? What will your bottom line be? There's no scrutiny of this, none whatsoever. Yet this bloke already thinks he's a shoe-in uh, to be um, Prime Minister of the country. Last one. Prime Minister, Doug, it's not quite clear yet on how the $200 million car package will be spent. Will this be given in grants to car makers? And if so, will Ford receive any of that money? There are individual measures for individual companies. Uh, Minister Carr is standing up um, in Adelaide very soon to go through those measures as they will apply to uh, individual manufacturing plants. Uh, I will leave uh, the detail to him to go through. I go back to the general principle, however, we support the Australian car manufacturing industry. Are you just hiding yourself from the light or are you no, trying to get a question? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. I just, just thought you were doing a bit of a stock of strange love there. Just, just on debates, Mr Rudd, you, yesterday you, um, uh, you know, charged Mr Abbott to one each Sunday, I think. Um, mm. They fight back a letter, one this Sunday, then two town hall type forums. Where's your, where, where's your position up to at the moment on that? It's very simple. Holding Mr Abbott to his word. Mr Abbott said on the 4th of July, as soon as you call an election, Kevin, I'll debate you any day, everywhere. That's what he said, not what I said. I think it's about time he was held to account for that. So I took him at his word. I assume he's an honest man. Uh, I took him at his word and said, well, we called the election yesterday. Writs are issued today. Let's go for the debate which I understand uh, Sky were planning to hold this evening. He refused. Guess what tomorrow morning I'm doing? I'm debating the Liberal candidate for Griffith uh, in my electorate in Brisbane, together with all the other candidates for my electorate. If the Liberal candidate for Griffith can stand up and have a debate with me as the member, as he should, and I respect him for doing so, that's the right thing to do as you go into an election in, uh, as in a uh, local electoral contest. Um, then the Liberal candidate for Griffith can stand up and debate me as the local member, why can't Tony Abbott? I think it's a fair question. On the broader point, I've said there are about f four networks or so, four Sundays, hop into one each of them and have a decent debate, like you see US presidential contest, where you folks among you, you, you decide who's going to be the panel of um, journalists from the extreme right to the extreme left and all those of you up the middle. The, um, uh, and uh, where are they from the extreme left? Are you from the, oh, yeah, we're still looking. The, uh, we're still looking. The, uh, and you decide uh, who it should be. Jobs, and you decide who it should be. Okay, we've got to run. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. See you, Dennis.